Hello there everyone and welcome back to, do you know, the last years of Europe. I'm your host, Mr. Guangdong Lover, but do not complain, do not protest. Yoshiko was supposed to be doing her work, but she couldn't resist taking a few glances at the situation around the room. Editor Takasaki was at the door, bowing deeply to the delegation of Kampatai officers and government representatives gathered there, mustering gratitudes, empty farewells as they left. The moment they were out the door, the editor collapsed into a nearby chair. There was no concentrating now. She went over. She began to speak, but Takasaki addressed her first. Yes, Kawa. I just did all of her jobs. Though the old man tried to appear calm, it was clear that the earlier Ben had rat him rattled slightly. He spoke in an uncharacteristically serious tone, his eyes locked straight at with hers. Yoshiko shuddered. You know what the whole series you and the others did about everyday life in Guangdong? They want to shut down the entire operation because of that. Takasaki straightened up in his seat, shifting vainly to be find a comfortable position. But don't worry, we're fine, we won't be shut down. Yoshiko turned wide at the mention. You're about to say that there's a catch. What will we have to do? The editor nodded. Going forward, the Canton Fujian Koran can only front articles that praise the government. Their exact words. A silence fell between both of them. Yoshiko knew better than a protest. At least their magazine was spared from the wave of closures occurring all over Guangdong, and the Chinese publications weren't so lucky. This was the price we have to pay, she thought. And if you want to read again, the adrenaline, adrenal scent of fear. I think I read this one last time. I could be wrong. Um, but if you can read this again, please go right ahead, so... Uh, city prisoners. The cities of Guangdong are undoubtedly its greatest pride and efficient, uh, yet exquisite constru construct or progress in order reigns supreme, however. Glorious these marvels of capability may be, the dense and chaotic nature of the streets is a perfect breeding ground for dissent. We've achieved much in addressing these glaring issues, and the prominent increase of the presence of our esteemed security forces being the most evident demonstration of such. Due to increased measures of the preservation of order, much of the population now prefers to simply remain in their residences, only leaving or perform essential tasks or to commute to work, of course. This has proven to be greatly beneficial to our cause, as the decreased presence of people in public is finally discouraged. Added to the uh, dissent and disobedience from ever rising on the soil and tarmac of the state. Well, uh, oh, if you wonder about both of these, please go ahead. Lose Chinese opinion, and then finally do whatever it is. Um, I don't mind doing that. How much uh, Japanese approval do we currently have? We got a lot of approval from the Kampai Tai. Actually, are we at 100%? Yes, almost 100%. 97%. And we do have, uh, oh, I forgot about this too. Well, we're doing the, uh, the Silicon Delta HM-10-110 home bath, a 200-liter external water storage, onboard heating unit. Ooh. Honestly, I could probably use a new shower place where I live. Uh, if that's the case, I don't mind doing this one, 4%, so we can burn about 2.5% here, huh? Perfect. Perfect. They love us. They really do. And with this current ordinance, public information and dis dis disinformation relief organ ordinance, not organization, but ordinance, Removes the ability of the press to slander the chief executive and report dissent against the state. Cool. It's not in session. Personal invitation. Ah. Uh, oh. Look at that. Uh, let's see. Chief Executive, Komaa Kenichiro just turned to leave when he heard Takashima speak again, catching him right at the beginning of the next routine in the long list of routines yet in a day. A quick walk out of, uh, of the consulate, down the stairs into a chauffeur, and then a drive to the Lego meeting to soothe whatever needed to be soothed next. He twisted his neck around and looked back at the still-sitting console. Yes? If it wouldn't trouble, trouble you, I would quite like to extend an offer of goodwill. I have quite the impressive chef on my staff in my official residence, and I would like to continue our discussion over that in a more pleasant and relaxed setting than this. Ah, oh, well, thank you for the offer, but I'm qu quite afraid that I have a meeting with the Legislative Council that I must attend to. Well, Chief Executive, it's always your decision, but I will tell you that the temporary is to die for. Takashima cocked his head to the side, taking a cigarette from his pack. Komaki Nichiro considered his options. A close relations to the Council General meant close relations to Japan, regardless of the cuisine on offer, and that could never be downplayed. But he did have a schedule to stick to. Decisions, decisions. He, he always had too many of them. Well, honestly, no, he doesn't. Let go doesn't matter. There are more prior important priorities than playing nice with the Japanese consulate. Game one more favor with the Japanese consul should become frustrated with us. I'm okay with that. The last one vote, one seat. Who cares? Oh actually, was that too much? That probably was too much. Oh yeah, that was definitely too much, my bad. Oh, that was way overkill. Oh well. Twenty two and a half. Twenty two and a quarter, I guess you say. So we need five percent more. And we'll be good. And political power, institution support. We'll wait for the one that's the numbers. Well, let's go in Jamaica. Cool. And there we go. Screaming through whispers. Guangdong is no longer a place where the humans live. Business is done, and some sort of life certainly is lived, but at no point does the human element come in, into play. All exists in the shadow of fear and paranoia. Of the police, of the camp I tie, of Hitachi as a whole. Nobody goes unaware of the raids, arrests, and security sweeps that occur. It's impossible to live in ignorance. Therefore, people will live in fear instead, one and all. 
Any complaints about this type of existence remain private and even then in hushed whispers. There's no telling when private is truly private with Hitachi's watchful eyes all around. The people will scatter when government vehicles approach, though they've learned as much, had the lesson beaten into them. All too many families have stories of relatives who disappeared after throwing a rock or uttering a curse. Bravery is a virtue. In Guangdong, virtue is a herald of death. There's a saying, murmured among the denizens of Koshu, the only two types of existence in the city are the property of owner property owners and the property owned. Which one are you, I wonder? Kick down every door. People have to learn to obey to understand that their worlds have irrevocably changed. The vacated streets of Guangdong, now prosperous, the organized and prevalent presence of dissidents have been nearly eradicated. Our veteran and security forces have dutifully and effectively secured the public premises of the cities. Its alleyways, storefronts, and intersections made comfortably calm. Despite this, conniving forces of dissent continue to lurk within the urban expanse of Guangdong, no longer in the open but behind closed doors. <clears throat> A compact and omnipresent tenements, and apartments lining the streets are akin to the nests of opposition. The decrepit ideologies and misconstrued creeds, festering from building to building, will demonstrate that the safety they presume is nothing more than an illusion. Their measly wooden and rusted steel doors offer trivial protection against the forceful boots of order. No homes are to be, ex are to be exceptions. Any person considered to be harboring dissenting beliefs will be susceptible for mandatory inspection. They will not learn. They will learn of the fruitlessness of evasion. They cannot escape or grasp. The Ministry of Truth. The Public Information and Disinformation Relief Ordinance was making its way smoothly through the Legislative Council when Komaki and Ichiro made, became aware of one minor problem. In order to enforce the ordinance, the government would effectively need to monitor every newspaper, magazine, scrap of media across the Republic. Every single word would need to be scrapped for signs of misconduct, every sentence examined for defiance. Naturally, this would mean a significant increase in the government's workload that it couldn't ignore. Of course, it was unnecessary to work all of it. There was no denying that the, so the ordinance would not be watered down at all, that the enforcement was even a little less careless. The Senku slipped through the cracks and then slowly surely Hitachi's authority over Guangdong would erode. That outcome is unacceptable, come I thought, and I would not let that happen. The question then becomes about what would, who would shoulder the burden of these innumerable new tasks? Kamai wondered whether a dedicated censorship bureau was necessary. Yes, it would mean on taking some additional costs, both now and over time. Nothing comes free after all. Uh, Moritz's men would cry foul louder than they already have, but the bureau could certainly make effective or make the actual implementation of the ordinance significantly more effective, and that can make the entire enterprise worth it. Kamal considered the proposal on his desk. He took out his pen, shook some stray ink off it, and then began writing a response. There's no little point in this. Do you proceed? It's probably a good idea. Consider it approved. Taming the tongue. Honorable members of the Legislative Council, it's the highest duty of the press to report the truth and nothing but the truth. However, these institutions also carry other important responsibilities of which they need reminding. Let me ask you a simple question. What purpose is freedom if it's misused? There's no answer from the floor, not even a single mumble. Instead, these members sat very still, completely fixated in their fear. A lot of changes Kamai has sent to power. Many still didn't know what to expect, just how Kamai, how much Kamai and Hitachi tried to reshape Guangdong. Even before the Public Information and Disinformation Relief Ordinance was introduced, all the Legislative Council expected to significantly increase censorship. But word soon got out that the Kamai wanted to even go any further. This relays alarms, but for now, there was nothing they could do but sit idly by. So the legislators did, listening to the Chief Executive deliver his proposal. The press is a responsibility to the people of Guangdong, a responsibility to safeguard the stability of our society. Far too many times, they undermine it instead. Pausing, Kamai took a sip of water before continuing, his voice more strident than before. We will most certainly allow people to speak, but we cannot allow sedition. We will not, we will not let these arsonists destroy our society. It has become clear that these places will not fix themselves. A firm hand is needed. My proposal is as follows. We must reorganize our press, reporting standards and codes. No stone must be left unturned. In truth, these reforms have been long overdue. A couple of them glanced at each other warily. It's easy to read between the lines. This would subordinate control of the press to Hitachi entirely. A sense of press would become a state-owned one. They anticipated Komai's next words. It's not as important as the moment. And this is our government's top priority. Rehauls the press and reporting codes to ensure that all the news follows Hitachi's rules. Of course. So I skipped that one earlier by accident, I didn't really mean to, but we read this one earlier, so it's a good idea. Yes. And we're at 100%. And we're mar uh, marking this towards Turkey. Fantastic. Impose silence. Oh. You should go walk into the office and uh, find our editor. Uh, Takasaki hunched over a government-issued bulletin, a sharp frown on his face. It came in this morning. They must have had it ready to go. Here, have a look. The older man passed the paper to her. Unsurprisingly, it was about the public information and disinformation relief ordinance, which only passed yesterday. Like everyone else, she expected the government to give them some guidance on the new law and what they needed to do to comply. But so soon, Yoshiko read the bulletin carefully, <clears throat> scrutinizing every word. The paper's instructions were stark. Staff from Hitachi would have to be welcomed to the Canton Fujin Koran within this week. Once there, these men would review any particularly sensitive articles in their magazines. Most importantly, they would have the power to stop the publications of any week's issue if it was deemed that conduct, uh, not conducted to public morality. Yoshiko knew that effectively meant it, it was for any reason. I thought she wanted. It was a complete total censorship, far above anything they'd had before. She turned back to her editor. I don't understand. We never defy the corporations. The words pro-Japanese is the rest. And now they completely muzzle us? Why are they doing this? 
The leader shook his head, and it's not just us, it's everyone. I'm sorry, there's nothing we can do. Yoshiko didn't dare think of what might happen if they dared to disobey. Beautiful. We lose 2% political power, which sucks, but... All right, all right, bap. Not bad. Just trying to make Guangdong a livable place. That's all we're doing. Kick down every door, my friends. Every door must be kick kicked down. I've actually not seen all this yet. Miracle in the Pro River, huh? Eleven days left. The breakneck speed of success. Extending the state of emergency, huh? No more growth, less stability though. Opium wars. Oh. Annual registry codes. GDP growth goes up. Uh, if you're about 1949, part two, please go right ahead. Blood soaked metal, even more growth. Beg us for death, invitation for the best. Blood Street sidewalks. <clears throat> Introduce a curfew. Uh, but Jane Home. J uh, Jun threw a fist at Yong Tong. When the, the first one missed, she threw another, knuckle slamming into the side of his ribcage. She threw another, then and another, then both of them colliding with the man's stomach. It may even hurt the man if Yu Tong hadn't been a fully grown man. I can't stop him. The fist thrown ten year old thought with tears in her eyes. Her father got to uh, on one knee, placed his briefcase beside him. He brought his handkerchief, wiping away Yun's streaming tears, holding her hands with his. If I stay, your mother stars. If I stay, you we will be forced to flee this apartment. My work puts food on the table, sweating. You understand someday, I promise. Will you be brave for me? She threw away his searching hands. I hate it. Don't go, Dad. You'll be arrested and tortured and hurt. That's what I always hear Uncle Kain talk about. He's always talking about the blue... Yu Tong sighed, scratching his forehead. I wish he wouldn't talk to about nonsense. If I can't explain it to you, so be it. I love you, sweetling. Please understand that, at least. He hadn't the word for dis his distraught daughter as he fled from her, their apartment. It will be hours until Yo Tong, Jun's father, returned to their home. He would have like, those black bags in his eyes, and he would have little more little words before dinner. And none after that, not even for Jun's mother. She felt like crying again. She put a chair close to the only window of the house, the little one by the kitchen with the white curtains with the little holes in it. Uh, it was only there that Jun would know the truth of her father's promise to his only daughter. The sweet call of home. The apartment call is next. Oh. Someone having a civil war? No, oh, they're having a West African Federation. Who cares? All right, uh, at the foot of profit. The future of Guangdong is just lays within our reach, and we must do whatever it takes to ensure it is within our grasp and initiate the economic revolution. Well, we can now begin the process of initiating protocols and measures to take uh, control of the economy of Guangdong, and with the help of our loyal friends at Nissan, of course, the apartment itself. Time passed uh, by awfully slow for Jun. She was on outside her father's apartments, and her mother was still recovering from that sickness. She could barely speak to Jun, and her pale skin and her droopy face were scary enough to look at. Uncle Kane came around from town to town, but he hadn't arrived yet today with his puffed up red face and a bulging second th chin. Jen turned to the stove, barely able to reach a gas switch, once, twice, three times, but on the fourth try, finally exploded into a dull, bluish cook flame. Jen weeded out a massive metal pot that was almost as difficult to throw on the stove as it was to turn the thing on. Filling it up with water was easy enough, and throwing in the unpeeled carrots and potatoes easier, but after that, there was nothing in the apartment for Jun. She hated her mother for falling ill, she hated her uncle for his absence, she hated her father for his working. She knew she hated it, at least she thought he did. Jun felt tears in her eyes again, so she returned, back to her little window with the white curtains with the little holes in it. Days turned to night, and her father still did not return. What if he never did? Does life find a way? Well, in Jurassic Park it does. I wish you could like, increase the... Uh, uh, product release, like even further. Look at that, 130 and half percent. Not bad, not bad overall. Company specific profitability bonuses, temporary profitability bonuses. The HM 110 home bath, for th most of history. A private bath on demand has been a rare luxury for anyone but the ultra rich. The average working person simply does not have time to spend hours heating bath or heating water to bathe them. So, hot baths in the home were reserved for those who could afford to hire servants dedicated to this specific purpose. With the new HM-110 home bath, Hitachi plans to change that. Small enough to fit into an average home bathroom, the HM-110 includes 200 liters of external water storage and an onboard heating unit, drastically reducing the labor necessary to heat a bath. There's more than one way to clean up a city. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Love it. We're doing great. Nothing can go wrong here, right? Absolutely nothing. Especially when there's never going to be a crisis of oil. Never. Ever would that happen. And France has fallen to civil war, I imagine. Ah, advancements. Very good. Uh, 70, 67, like we said, but, you know, we got still got time. Tempered methods. It's a great pleasure to Mohammed, no longer to have to put sift through these mountains of paperwork every week. 
Before the new Hitachi computer arrived at the mill, you would end up sitting in the office for hours on end, looking at the driest possible reports on steel output, pro worker productivity, and costs. As a general manager for the mill, such a task would fall to him if all else failed. Now, with a few pushes of a button, he could simply let the computer take care of the counting, and by God, it wasn't needed. Thanking his supplies for the day, Mohammed looked out of his office window below, seeing the many workers toiling away. He nodded to himself, satisfied. They were working at the exact level local uh, Turkish businesses like his needed to be at to compete with the German comp competition in the Reichsfeker. As the the factory felt the hot Turkish air on his skin, Mohammed smiled. The future would be bright for him and his workers if technology kept progressing at the rate it was. The more streamlined, of course, the better. Corporate sanitation. Ooh. This is corruption, though. Well, well, here's more growth. And more liquid reserves? What's not to love? I love liquid reserves. Formation of the Guangdong Federation Tradesmen. Oh. Where's the glass? Oh, look at this. Yay, we actually beat him. Yay. The Zhujin concept has always been artificial. Uh, everyone knew this, not at least among them, Koma Kenichiro. When it took power, the people of Guangdong knew it, knew it once that he knew. Uh, but they also knew, and they were not surprised by his utter contempt for the idea of a Zhujin outside of his control. Some amount of time had passed since Komai's seizure in the aftermath of the Yusuda crisis and the collapse of that attendant governor, successor governments. During this time frame, countless Zhujin run businesses, subsidiaries, and other sort of organizations, once supported by the Guangdong Economic Order, sink below the surface. Having been supplanted by Hitachi and its chosen subsidiaries, these entities had no choice but to go to the wall or underground as Komai and his men increase their profits and share of the economy. As a result, small businesses and groups of laborers organize in defense of their own interests. Komai's government isn't interested in helping us achieve what they want, they said. It also does precious order things that he loves so much. There's nobody else in Guangdong who can represent her voice to the government, so we've got to do it ourselves. Either that or we just lay down and die. Raise a glass. Komai saw her back in his office, gladly awaiting the sake nestled between newspapers and bouquets on his desk. For the last few hours, he balanced between soft-spoken interviews, conversations with beloved allies, and a delighted cause from seeking about the state of his nation. They were all reacting to the same news, Guangdong had overtaken him and Chuko in this year's economic reports. During the last interview, Komai now posed a fa fascinating question. Do you, Komai Kenichiro, now consider Guangdong the model economy of the sphere? What the best. Beautiful. Uh, uh, a softball, but there's a core truth to it, something which knocked around Komai's head as he popped the cork, popped the cork from the socket. To the world at large, Guangdong was vindicated, uh, perfected, a true model for the nations of the world. There was much irony to that point. Komai built his, his nation with uh, Manchuko as his model. Yet with that, he created something masterful, something even beyond any Manchurian bureaucrat's grasp. The playing industry expansions was a feat that would forever be celebrated as the work of Komai Kinoshiro. He poured the sake and spun it gleefully around his glass. In a smooth motion, Komai went out in for a sip. Delicious, he thought to himself, what else could be better? To a bright future. Beautiful, my friends. Increases Japanese approval by 50%. Oh my god. Uh, we can't burn it fast enough to actually use it correctly. The futility resistance. The dusk approached a glistening pearl of Koshu. A city engulfed in a maelstrom of vicious lights. The city bristled with its usual activity, a mesmerizing cacophony of voices and sirens, an embodiment of the pride of Guangdong and its chaotic nature. Contrasting the animated atmosphere of the streets are the bands of armed guards occasionally marching down the sidewalk. Their expression stern, the posture is precise, a symbol of the presiding administration of the state. Uh, Pak Tu Leong, uh, continuing on his brief walk home, thoughts of wages and his weekly expenditures pacing through his head. He noticed that the asphalt pavement in front of his building was unusually empty. A sort of contrast to the crowd of returning factory laborers only the previous day. He glanced to the right. Two armored beige vehicles were parked haphazardly on the side of the road, seemingly innocent yet emanating an ominous aura. Something, of course, was wrong. Oh, look at this. Use the camp like tide? Why not? Pak stepped onto the cruelly constructed granite staircase in his blocks. He looked up as he caught a glance of a figure seemingly obscuring off in a hurry, accompanied with heavy footsteps. As he continued to escalate uh, the staircase, the lumbering sound of boots on the concrete grew even louder, until an unmistakable sound rang out from the hallway above. A single gunshot. The, remain, the remnants of the sound lingered in his eardrums as he began to run frantically for his apartment. There was no mistaking it. It was a camp by time the security forces. A faint voice of a man desperately pleading for mercy in Cantonese was silence. Yet with another gunshot following the sharp scream of a woman, the men fell out of the home mere seconds later, one of them carrying a pistol with white smoke permeating into the air. As he reached his flat, closed the door behind him and breathed a sigh of relief, one of the last muffled gunshot could be heard. What was there to be done, thought Pak. There's no purpose in resistance unless you wish to face the wrong end of a gun. Legends of armored trucks below began to hum as they left the pavement, packed with prisoners and officers, vanishing on the horizon, moving towards the abyss. An everlasting reign of terror. No, I want to use this more. But there's nothing. There's literally nothing we can do with it. I mean, we can spend more political power, but that would do nothing. We should police control too. Oh, that's really, really what we don't want to do. Um, yeah, nothing really here we want to do. Oh, this is weird. There's Chinese stuff we could do. Burn some goodwill. Hey, you know what? It's for the growth. 
Product cycle? There's nothing there for this. Oh, god dang it. Uh, we want to do this one. Uh, the courteous call. Find out your Haruspissy. Haruspissy? Yes, Akao Yoshiko, correct? Uh, this is Captain Shintani. We're from the Kempatai. Can we come in? That question didn't need to be answered. The tall captain, flanked by a few other military men in uniform, let themselves in before she could respond. Yoshiko. Go up trying her best to hide it. This visit was an unplanned one early in the morning. Why were they here? What do they want with her? We're checking out a few of our fellow Japanese. There's one question that we would like to, you to answer. Why are you in this part of town? You know there aren't many of our compatriots in this part of town. There would be no escape then. Yoshiko knew that they wouldn't take no. She composed herself. My father was a baron back on the home islands. He was ruined when Yasuda collapsed. We moved here permanently. Then my father died. He didn't leave me much, so I settled here. Is this answer satisfactory? Something seemed to collect with the captain, who tells it to head slightly backwards. Yeah, I think so. Situations, even among our countrymen, can be very different. Allow me to extend my apologies. That seemed to settle things, but why did Yoshiko feel like something bad was going to happen? The captain turned to leave just before doing so. He paused, turning around and addressing Yoshiko clearly. You should consider moving out of the area. We don't arrest our fellow citizens without suspicion, of course, but if you publish anything questionable again, we might think you're living here for, shall we say, other motives. You shouldn't give us a reason to go after you. Financial stuff. Irritating corporations will soon only exist in the annals of history and financial records, as our chief executive has sanctioned numerous acts to extirpate whatever structure or organization that remained of these resistance establishments. We have appropriated the funds and monetary resources of the state to our security agencies, dispatching to seize and confiscate the properties, capital, and assets of various dismantled and impotent corporations formerly operating across Guangdong and the Three Pearls. These initiatives are, of course, committed under the direct authority and permission of our illustrious chief executive, initiatives that will lead to the centralization of the economy and of the consumer markets, under the all-encompassing jurisdiction of Hitachi. The entrails of carcasses may still prove to be beneficial to our cause. Look at all that political power we get, because we're definitely going to need it later. Um, yeah, correct on that corruption, man. 63% is actually really bad. My god, that's so bad. Uh, purge corrupt officials? Yeah. That'd be good. Ah. Beautiful. Uh, let's go with there and then there. Just building up a lot of roads, man. We're here to build a Guangdong. Surplus is pretty good. Growth is very good. Oh my god. Add the foot up profit. Economic reshuffling. The mood of the Legislative Council was grim, at least for Komai's opposition. He looked around the room, the many worn out faces out staring at deadpan at each other. How could this happen? Komai heard them saying. Their opinions didn't matter. Nissan and chief executives had a vision, and these men were merely. Ooh. We're only obstacles in this path. Oh. What happened here? A new reality for the Crown Jewel of the Sphere. Oh boy. The economic reshuffling package had gone through as a council successfully, and numerous key facilities until as few seconds ago were private. We're now being seized by the Cantonese police and Japanese soldiers in order to benefit the state. No more will petty companies vie for a petty control. Nissan shall control all, and through Nissan we shall control all. An uneasy truce. Kamal was a to admit it, but he had been a little apprehensive upon hearing that the military had finally toppled the rotting Manchurian government. It's a king. It's a king. There were plenty of lunatics up there radical enough for a hair to be torn out among Yo headquarters. It was pleasantly surprised then when <clears throat> I was finally able to meet the elusive Sijima Uruzio. The males were appreciative of the contributions of the Japanese business, a rare enough trade in the IJ these days, and took, took great pains to assure him that neither he nor Mang Yo need fear military rule in Manchukuo. In fact, he had gone so far as to offer his assistance in integrating Guangdong with Manchukuo. Not all, however, was quite as it seemed in the New North, though. Though Saijima had been quick enough to meet with him once his plane touched down in Sikin, Kumai had been repeatedly and strategically delayed from being able to actually visit Meng Yo headquarters. Though he was by no way means privy to the internal workings of the military in Manchukuo, uh, Kumai could tell that Saijima was a man overflowing with ambition. It was clear enough that when he extended his offer to have help, that Saijima didn't want Guangdong integrated with the Manchukuo as much as he wanted it integrated with himself. One, Master Hitsing was in a difficult off in its own. Two, would be unworkable. As the sun outside his plane touched the horizon, sending brilliant plumes of purple and orange soaring into the sky, Kamai found himself wondering which of the two he would rather find himself serving his years behind five. A new dance begins. Oh boy. Why don't we do a cup of coffee to keep the nest warm? Uh, I said earlier, um, concuss, uh, coordination. Uh, if you're gonna read some, please go ahead. Tell them they'll enjoy the season. That's fine. All right, get yourself digits. Four percent more. Oh my god. Please, please control them. It's fine with us. We don't care. Just a couple more days with this one. See if we can get any more approval. Do we have any more money? No. Oh, yeah. The French are killing the French, which is fine with us. It's only French. Hey, advancements in computational power technology? Nice. Happy November, everybody. Little surprises. 
Oh, I've heard of this one before. If you want to do this one, please go ahead, too. Oh, I don't know the time to go on. Nice. Oh, darn it. That's okay. Hey, those are down below 40% from now. Corruption's still going up, which sucks, but whatever. Um, corporate sanitation. For taking advantage of how of having state funds at our disposal, we'll buy up rival companies, we can buy the economic restructuring measures. Hitachi will become the primary shareholder of these corporations, neutering them from engaging in effective competition or resisting any further government actions. Everything is ours. There wasn't even time for the dust to settle yet before the men arrived. The police. <clears throat> I just finished hauling away the Zujin owner. A certain Mr. Wong arrested for support for subversive elements where the auditor showed up at the door, surprising both officers and the employees alike. There were three of them in total, short men with strands of thin, white hair. They barely clung to their heads. They stood in the office, pens and notebooks in hands, assessing everything worth a single cent. Utterly disinterested in the employees milling around, carrying a certain authority of them despite their seeming meekness. Telephones, computers, paper, even a tiny cactus eraser, all were itemized in the auditor's books. A few minutes later, one of them spoke, addressing the leader of the operation. We're from Hitachi. Your orders to keep everything in the way this office exactly as it is. The officer was somewhere taken aback, but he responded nonetheless. Yes, of course. We we're already planning to do that. Preserving the crime scene is important. It isn't about that. Due to Mr. Wong's crimes, all assets and financial records of this company are immediately forfeited to the government of Guangdong. Make sure that the financial records and all the assets are secure. We'll come back tomorrow in the morning with some other men, and Hitachi does not want to see a single sheet of paper missing. The auditors left without saying anything further, leaving the police to pick up the pieces. Seeing the dumbfounded employees were escorted out on the street, none of them were arrested, but it was their luck much better. Considering they were now jobless, it wasn't. A single company was fully responsible. Hitachi takes and takes and takes until nothing's left. Vulture of the Remains. How many days we got? Uh, it takes 30 days. We'll probably need to do uh, corner survivors. No, more severity. Great. Uh, hurts our corruption, but whatever. Though our endeavor, extermination, and growth has proved to be beneficial and extensive, we must not allow the remaining corporations to revel in their moment of relief. Oh, look at that. Uh, the strength and will of Hitachi must be demonstrated and made clear for every single corporate entity present throughout Guangdong and our chief executive did not overlook. Any corporation still operating within our spheres of influence will be forced or coerced into partnership with Hitachi, whether that equates to becoming a productive subsidiary or being merged entirely into the corporate apparatus of Hitachi. We've demonstrated our dominance across Guangdong's economic stage. Let there not be examples of resilience against our might. Yes. Advancement and power efficiency. Yes, hail Hitachi. Getting a little, little nuky there, huh? Beautiful. Yeah, we've so we get two and a half, literally two and a half political power every single day. Wow, inflation is doing great. We have a yearly surplus, twenty five percent real growth. That's insane. What's not the love? We're doing great. We're turning Guangdong into what it should be, a paradise for the entrepreneur. Yeah. The cleansing. As the sun rose over the beautiful Guangdong of Komaki Nichiro, this he was sitting in the central office of his state's tax bureau and listening to Yo Koi Hideki talk about the total reorganization of the economy in accordance with the reformed bureaucrats' methods that had brought Manchukuo to greatness. Now, the economy was to be totally reshuffled until it was nothing more than a Yakuza playground and, more importantly, a clone of Manchukuo. Yu Kuo sat neatly across the room from his targets, the various tax bureau directors of the state of Guangdong. Speaking slowly, dressed smartly, he dictated the ground-up rebuilding of Guangdong's tax methods. Komai sat be quietly beside his tax czar, or economy czar, aloof and silent, smoking his favorite brand of cigarette. He first had one of those in the Manchukuo during the war, and he had never had any others. Knowing that Yokoi had the situation under control, he felt free to just ruminate on the things like tobacco. He gamed it all out beforehand, so he did not bother paying attention this time around. The directors, on the other hand, were to a man resisting the urge to turn pale with shock. These diktats of Komai terrified them, but the atmosphere that Yokoi and Komai had created meant that they had no choice but to comply. The corporate sanctions or sanitation begins and shall proceed unrelentingly. Look at that. Every time as time goes on, we're slowly getting more and more fascist. Cool. Uh, buy up stock, shares, and patronage of corporations to flood Guangdong with new capital. We spent a billion dollars, which is a lot, but more growth, increased Japanese export support, ten percent more corruption, which is really freaking high, honestly. That's uh, a bit too high for me, but you know, whatever. No, another corporate cycle. Trying to keep corruption down is, you know, it's not easy. With so much political power, I'm not super concerned. Hey, advancing in data storage, nice. If you're in loathing, if you want to buy that, please go ahead, but vulture of the remains. Oh, or, or maybe you don't want to be happy first. 
When Chan Ma Hin arrived with his family Yuka, the crowds were enormous, now transformed into an enormous hot springs resort. Oh. Ooh. I think I read this one before, too. The room had not a speck of dust on it. Yeah, please read this one if you want to. As we continued upon a righteous endeavor to resuscitate and restore Guangdong's de debilitated economy to its proper state, it required that we eliminate a perfect... Pesteriferous obstacles preventing steady progress, so much have manifested themselves in the form of corporations. Akin to wild brambles and thistles, we must clear these nestled some corporations, many of which have already been infiltrated and crippled due to our policies, with a machete of state funds and executive decrees. As most of them have already been immobilized, the only thing left to do is to bring them upon the blade, upon the foliage, and exterminate their presence within the economy. Our chief executive will enact several initiatives to disassemble and dissolve the remnants of resistance of corporations, and they shall disappear for, into the records vine by vine. A rude awakening. Uh, Tong dragged by his heavy feet in the darkened office, not yet illuminated by the morning sun that usually peeked through the blinds of his windows. Throwing out his hand, he slapped the wall a few times to find the light switch before him, eventually flicking it and yawning with a pain groan. Early mornings were not for him. The sheets of paper that stacked like totems in the dark carpeted room were a pain to get around, but eventually Tong made it to a seat behind the desk. The recent economic reorganizations ordered by the chief executive's direct orders were torturous to get around. Tong had spent many late nights, early mornings, and countless tea breaks highlighting uh, important information and statistics that was thrown away his way from the local government offices by the newest courier. The bags under his eyes seemed to drag him lower and lower as each night spent in the overtime not a sleep fatigue chunk out of his wits. It was only his denial of a recent offer to merge with a Hitachi partner that Tong felt confident in his administrative position usually. The endless hours and bureaucratic constraints tightened around his neck was enough to chip away at his rationality. The recent decision, as gloomy as it felt in the early hours of the day, was the right one to make, he thought. Standing up to the larger corporation was putting the shareholders first. Swinging back in his chair and throwing, throwing his folded coat over a nearby piece of furniture, Tung stretched once more before returning his attention to the various sheets of fox paper sprawled out in front of him. There only was something he did not remember resting on top of the pages. A brown envelope, thickened by its contents, sat at the top of the sheets. Tung reached forward, plunging his hands within and blinking a few times so he could witness that what, what, what would emerge. Photos of his car that drove to and from with work. Work, from work with, but it was his home, even with some pictures of his children sat at the table through the window, unknowing of the photographer captured in the shop. The photos sickened tongue, and he dropped them back on the face of the desk, frowning with horror. A final note emerged from the envelope written in red ink, robbing tongue of his very breath. You know what you must do. Oh boy. If you read this one, please go to head too. Under new management, the county has been torn apart from the inside out, and then mopped up cleanly the hands of Hitachi, by the order of Kamai, and the new and improved economy that we have created. Hitachi holds a firm monopoly over the functions of society and has become indistinguishable from the government. Just as planned. When every billboard has a Hitachi logo on it, then Guangdong shall understand who rules. Decreases Japan's approval. Oh, it increase, decreases China's approval. Increases Japan's approval. Nice. Desperate measures, huh? Vultures that remain. Fire is getting worse, but who cares? Alright. I know I'm right. Nice about that. Mistakes we make. A procession of ex excuses marched through Yamauchi's head as he drove through the dilapidated house district, gray blocks rising from the earth. On the edge of this district, bordering a commercial district, there was a small abandoned building, three floors, decent size, within walking distance of streets lined with bars. Yamauchi turned into a garage, killed the engine, then idled in the car for ten minutes before he even mustered up the courage to get out. Ah, Mr. Yamauchi, said a lanky man in a flashy suit, flanked by younger, meager, meaner associates. Uh, offering uh, Yamauchi a toothless grin. So glad you can make it. Yamauchi shook his hands with Omura. He had the management sense. <clears throat> Omura had the cap, but they both had their connections. They, they valued each other for these things alone. They entered into a back room, took a seat on the folding chairs around a car table lit by a single overhead bulb. Omura, Omura made his demands. Yamauchi retorted with a practice of ease. He still knew how to read people, how to handle a negotiation. He wanted to put these skills to better use, but the march of excuses trampled over his doubts. In the wake of Hitachi, Manchurian businesses were swift to become the only businesses in town. Nintendo had little space to enter the market. What access had shrunk daily. Omura was offering something, he had to take it. That struck a deal. One of Omura's associates took out a black briefcase. Yamauchi opened it, took a stack again, closed it. This would have to do. I'll call this construction crew tomorrow, and we'll get started on the renovations. Should take two months. I'm still working on the zoning papers for the other place, but they'll give me those in a week or two. I hope that's not too much for a delay. Oh, the girls will be waiting. Omura flashes. Flashed him another toothless grim. It's not like they have anywhere else to go. Two months later, the first love hotel on Yamauchi's books opened up. <sighs> Nothing like a bunch of love, right? That's right. Love hotels? Uh, sounds totally great. Their uh, mains vultured. Darn it all, when Toyoda, a salaried man of the Canton, 
uh, Sashi and Corporation went to work, he found to his horror that the uh, his office job there, which had been fairly decent, all told, if something difficult had been cut by a decree from above. That ruthless man, Kamai Kenichiro, had gutted his employer, and Toyota, noticed, one heck of a lot of other companies overnight, absorbing them into Hitachi and mass and trimming the fat. As Toyota packed his, up his goods and left the building for what was very likely, likely the last time, he watched in horror as workmen replaced the logo of the previous building owners with that of Hitachi. Toyota knew he was likely done for. Unemployment was never a good fate for young man in Guangdong. His thoughts began to swirl as panic, fear, and all the other emotions of beleaguered, recently laid off workers took a hold in his mind. How would he feed himself? How would he hold on to his home? How would he find a new job? How would he do anything, really? How, how would... And he kept thinking, a sharp headache came on and did not fade. In the manner, the vulture devoured another morsel. I can review. If you want to buy that, please go ahead. More seats. Great. And even more Japanese approval. The Japanese love us. Because why wouldn't they? You know, keep getting these opinion ones because we have enough. We have more, way more than enough political power, which is insane. Uh, we can wait for that one. Mother well, should ask for mercy. Good to see you, Komai began, just flashing a wry smile. I'm so sorry to keep you waiting. What brings you to the office today? Let's get to the point. We both know that you want your new ordinance passed, Mother Shida said, so base as ever. I have a proposal on both Fujitsu and Mother Fujitsu. Mother Shida and Fujitsu. Certain uh, seats on both our boards will be reserved for representatives from Hitachi. You continue. Should your company wish to uh, take them, we also actively assist the government in subordinating Guangdong's other corporations to it. Komai raised an eyebrow. He expected Masashi to begin with the concessions, let alone offer so many. Sure, there was a catch he had expected, and what do you expect in an exchange? He ventured. Leave us alone. Do so, and your ordinance passes. The chief executive eyed him closely, focused on what it was unsaid. The deal was preserved their boards, protecting mo more than a bit of their prize fiefdoms, but Komai identified another problem. Even if we accept, what makes you think your legislators will get will follow you? How much support can you realistically get? Matsushita's reply was blunt and short. You will have enough, Komai realized. Matsushita wasn't even confident in his own answer. He contemplated his next move, seeing factors shift like pieces on a chessboard. I'm afraid Hitachi doesn't see the benefits of this agreement. Very well, let's take your deal. Hitachi's mercy. Ensures the safety of the different corporation executives' boards as long as there is a percentage of Hitachi points on them. Nope. Get back to work. We don't need them. Put you two and Hitachi together. If we do this, we'll spend a billion dollars. More growth, like I said earlier, so. As Kamai was leaving just from a just finished session of the Legislative Council, discussing the financial reorganization and revitalization ordinance, of course, it was met by the door by the face of Fujitsu Limited. Uh, himself. An un unwelcome surprise, he thought, as his life's lips tightened into an awkward smile. Good evening, Ibuka. I trust that you found this recent hearing productive. Ibuka didn't look pleased, and his next words were curt and direct. I came to you directly because I have a deal. Frankly, I don't give a single rat's butt about what you do with other companies. Do whatever you want with those inferior ignoramuses. He paused for a moment. Come on, get sense that he wasn't finished yet. When Ibuka spoke again, his voice was steadier than before. But in order to destroy Vegetu's independence, in exchange, I'll get most of my faction to support Hitachi's ordinance in the Lego. The Vigitu chief spoke with conviction. Kamai knew he was probably telling the truth. Still, the chief executive wasn't convinced, and Ibuka picked up on that. I suggest that you pay, uh, think of the optics, Kamai. Business and state. Working and progressing together. Now, doesn't it look good to Tokyo? No, to the entire world? Kamai wondered how to best respond. We'll make it happen together. Our visions of society are clearly different. No, Ibuka. No deal. A merchant's republic. I think their path through the future has manifested itself clearer than ever. As Hitachi now sits resolutely in command of Guangdong's governance, economy, and civilian sectors. The reins of power firmly within her palm. Hark, however, and behind the crystalline skylines of Koshu, Hong Kong, and Macau, and anonymous rumbling echoes. Thunderstorms of deceit, ever elusive and ever ferocious, constantly look beyond the horizon, scheming to devour the foundations of our prosperity we have so meticulously assembled. But no matter, never a feeble radical more like Morita Akeo, a hidebound pen pusher like Matsushita Masaharu, nor a delusional technocrat like Ibuka Masaru, our chief executive will serve dutifully as the vanguard of Guangdong's rejuvenation, the raven enlightenment to disperse the storm clouds of barbarism. With Nissan's full might, the engine of progress shall march on, undeterred and uninhibited, and by the time our grand design finally attains perfection, all will have known their place within. Kamai sits high upon the loki lo of wealth and power and sees Guangdong lying across straight before him. Um, the most irritating man in the world. You read this, please go ahead. And what's good for Japan? You read this, please go ahead. You know, we'll take that one. Just because uh, we can still burn more goodwill if we need to. How many more days left do we have this one? Six days. Like vultures. Ah! Uh, a few minutes after the markets opened, they realized something was very, very wrong. When the let go passed the financial reorganization and revitalization ordinance in a contentious late night session, some felt more prepared than others for the eventual assault on their businesses. None of that mattered. A single buyer was flooding the markets with cash, easily outbidding everyone else for distressed companies, the weaker ones, on the edge of Masashida, Fujitsu, and Sony's business empires. 
and the panicked boardrooms and other three companies. They quickly figured out what was happening. This buyer deployed and was still deploying enormous amounts of capital. The recently passed ordinance gave Hitachi enormous amounts of capital. It was clear that Hitachi was using that money to destroy every single competitor that dared not kneel. Come on, men. We're not known for restraint, but the sheer aggression and ruthlessness of that show today was far above anything else anyone had ever seen. The brokers and investment banks flushed with ca ca cash were uh, well, the only happy men in Guangdong from their unrestrained glee at one could tell that the project was going down well, well indeed. Guangdong's the leaders, however, were frantically trying to defend their empires by all means necessary, triggering every poison pill, employing every delaying tactic. Most importantly, this meant outbidding Itachi, no matter how expensive that was going to be. Kumai himself watched all this from the comfort of his office, remaining rather nonplussed by this valiant, hopeless act. If they want to use all their money to save these worthless companies, he thought, that's their prerogative. It only makes their core businesses weaker. That whole situation reminded him of that cliched maxim, heads, I win, tails... You lose. Grim King. The cabinet rose as Kamala entered the room. A sense of anticipation, even nervousness, filled the air. Not even the champagne poured for the cabinet members could dispel this feeling. Kamai strained his tie, gave the slightest of nods to his men, and sat. The cabinet followed suit, and then Kamai just said three words very softly, Your report, please. The man seated at Kamai's left hand cleared his throat and rose from his chair. He clutched a mandala folder in his hand, then began to speak. Kamai didn't look at the man once in the twenty minutes he spoke. Kamai to all the world. It appeared as if his mom was a thousand miles from the room in which he sat. The only sign he heard anything uh, the cabinet member said at all was a grin that slowly crept across his face. And then he began to chuckle. The cabinet member stopped talking. There was a questioning look on his face. Kamai wrapped his fingers around the stem of the champagne glass with a consummate skill and rose from the seat. The cabinet hastened to join him. To our success, he said, tipping the glass to his lips, a merchant's republic, indeed. And to those to those who left, left behind. Uh, I might have read this one, I'm not sure. Uh, let's see. Uh... I heard what happened to Li and Feng. They said that the son was still deal dealing like his father. So they threw Feng in jail. Okay, well that's BS. First it was Green Island over that ridiculous contract nail. Mazashita spun a pen in his desk. Watching a circle around its center like a broken compass, he survived, but he cannot be thankful for this. He suffers only a fraction of the scrutiny and sabotage that Sony endures. Yet this brings him no comfort. Where is he now, as far as he can go, at the whims of mercy of Hitachi? He sounds his desk. Why them? Why not Fujitsu, even Sony? Why must he now suffer being Hitachi's slave, coveting a throne the Kamai will never abandon? Home Islands don't care, I know these people, Kishing. It doesn't matter how many bodies Itachi churns through as long as their earnings statements look good. There were reports on Uboka's desk, but he couldn't read them. And every time his brain, a train of thought was back on track, Kamai Kanachiro snuck on board and pulled brakes. He couldn't even claim the new regime is targeting him. Fujitsu had never grown slightly. Permitted table scraps from Hitachi's attacks on Sony and Matsushita, but how long could he last? Ibuka sees the way Kamai looks at him in the cabinet, knowing it's only a matter of time before it's Fujitsu's turn, and he doesn't know what to do about it. Guangdong's gonna blow up. Or gonna blow if he keeps it keep, if he keeps us up. Okay, you know that effing monster. Keep it down, Marita hissed with his clenched teeth. Lee took a breath. Slumped down and stared at his bat bowl. Uh, Marita looked over his shoulder. What was that man in the corner knew? This hole in the wall was supposed to be their safe haven, but did the Kempa know tie about know about this? Marita ate his noodles, but he could not register their taste. And the high above them all is come on, Kenichiro, undisturbed by their woes. The breakneck speed of success. The dream of this industrious land where men are raised on the virgin soil so for people's success is one familiar to the nation of Guangdong. Our assistants chase his dream instinctively, and we too will advance the prosperity of our nation on the Pearl River to find a future among riches. No man, however, among us is more willing to chase us after this dream than chief executive, Komai. With the flick of a pen and a print of a stamp, the toils of the state's great citizenry will be organized behind a collective effort for prosperity and affluence. Together, let us prime our economy to prepare for the final leap to greatness. And all regulatory codes, huh? More growth, I like that. Um, Blood-soaked metal. Also, between this, uh, this, between the fade out, between this one and the earlier one, um, I have basically had to replay the entire campaign because at the time of recording there was an uh, April Fool's update and it kind of destroyed my save. Ah, <sighs> god dang it! Uh, Staying in the state of emergency. We're in grave danger. We remain so despite the apparent tranquility descending upon our streets. Maggots don't eat; they infest. Maggots just won't come out under the broad daylight. No, they'd rather wiggle in their petty heaps of rot in the shadows. Defiling your second nation where they're revolting stench like the rich of Burman they are. How else should we exterminate those colony after colony of maggots to if not pry every house? Uh, let's see. Ooh, modern to maintain. Uh, every sewer and decontaminate all with the fiercest of fires. How else are our dearest chief executive and his lieutenants to deliver Guangdong or promise salvation if not liberate her from the weaklings? Plotters and degenerates everywhere by rooting out right where they hide. There's no way around the alternative in sight. We're in grave danger and there's never too much we can do to rid ourselves of it. We'll snuff out the embers of treachery one by one. Uh, if you don't know about this one, please go ahead. That's just from all the stuff we've done um, with uh, uh, the product cycle. So, look at some comments. Include Hitachi's a very bad company. Someone says, "Oh, a new video. I love you." Someone says, "There's one more path, and that is Guangdong under the Imperial Japanese Army." Um, I'm not sure how to exactly get that. Is that like to get that path? Do you have to like fail during the riots? You know, the Guangdong riots. So, I think that might be it. But 
Let me know in the comments below how to get that last path. Raise yourselves for the revolution. Come on, Kinichiro stares at his wall, sitting behind the grand desk in his office. 11.27. The briefing on the economic situation will begin shortly at 11.30. All around him, the top economists of Guangdong are strewn about, talking to themselves or to each other, waiting for the clock to strike half. He clocks it again, the clock is struck. Gentlemen, please take your seats. The time has come, the chief executive announces. Immediately, the grouping of economists take their places as one of them, a long, thin man dressed in a beige suit, passes around the new report. Now that we're all here, please turn to the page 17 for the general summary. As you can see, there are characters and numbers strewn about. And Kenichiro merely skims over it. They all report good tidings. There's a bright future in your business, indeed. Kenichiro thinks before the man continues. Currently, profits for Hitachi are projected to grow at a late rate of 17% this year. And our margins are only going to cost, grow as costs become lower. I see, said the chief, chief executive, before continuing. In any case, I am pleased with the results we have achieved thus far. Noises of concurrence rang across the room as the man nod and smile. Even so, we mustn't be too complacent. Brace yourselves, men. There's yet more work to be done. Nice. Uh, do we want to pass this ordinance? Public safe, stability and security ordinance. Oh. Interesting. Introduce a curfew. Bagus for death. Oh, this is that one. I want more uh, stability. Bagus for death. There are people that scurry in the shadows, etching mischief in articles and journalistic pieces. Their filth corrupts the minds of readers and rots in the morale of our hardworking people. Guangdong will show no tolerance towards beliefs antithetical to its industrious traditions, uh, nor to those who spout them. I like poisons or rats, we'll initiate a series of raids and take down in places. We're supposed to sus suspect these criminals faster to ultimately eradicate their presence altogether, no matter. If their nails claw the very brick walls as we drag them from where they dwell, it is paramount these animals are punished for their deviance and mischief. As you can see, we have quite a bit of uh, corruption here, unfortunately. Going up by 1.5% every month, which sucks. Um, we're maxed out here, pretty much, with everything can't buy Thai. Uh, I've destroyed any support from the Chinese, really. And even the Zhujin as well, so. But growth is pretty good. Growth is pretty darn good. You gotta love it. Oh, that's getting better too. Oh, we're about to have better admin efficiency too, as it started in December. Nice. Another comment was, oh yes, come I, a wholesome guy, right? Yeah, absolutely. Someone says, the Manchurian has become chief executive. Now he's begun to implement his brutal Manchurian system to Guangdong. That was not a love. The drone of decree. So, when do you suppose it'll all be over? <clears throat> uh, came Ah Guang's, ah Guing's usual tender, tender, curious voice. Ah, uh, Su Ken not, said nothing. She reached for her cheeks, engrazing her callous worn fingers, just as well as another ever growing cascade of wrinkles. She chuckled, and Sir all bubbled up her throat. It was like times like this that made her almost forget she was a, but a 22 year old young woman, quite the age of youthful vigor, and yet she could barely even secure an assembly line post. Just see it for yourself. She gave a nonchalant wave at the young man in the living room behind her, and her head unturning. There wasn't anyone left anyway, she thought. Her 16-year-old cousin compiled and settled beside her on the balcony, and together they gazed out on the horizon, as they had done again and again ever since the heavens darkened. Together they saw not just the colorful billboards of the white, white swirling street lamps of Macau, but also the brown, dirty headlights of the Camp Tai jeeps littering the ground, barely five stories below, like splashes upon a ca stained canvas, fluttering in the gusting seasoned, seaside wind. Tell me, she whispered, who's our goner in the building today? Ah, wings. Eyes directed to his cousin's face in bafflement. Mom and Dad will come back to us once it's all over, unlike those actual criminals his voice trembled. I don't get why you think. And how long has it been they've been in temporary custody already? Six months? Seven? Barked Asuk. Her vocal cords teetering on exhaustion. Good heavens, it takes a effing obituary for Uncle and Auntie to, on the papers to make her oblivious, but see the BS behind it all, doesn't it? I guess that's not even effing happening then. Because, like heck, the news people will even bother with one anyway. State of emergency, my butt. I should check out once more and offer herself another cigarette as she only remained. Her only remaining relative looked down, face frozen with horror. Over? It'll never be over. That comment was, uh, after this walkthrough, can you use a TNO semi called Sony Plus? Uh, maybe, we'll see. I don't know. Maybe. Blood soaked metal. More growth? More growth! How can you possibly hope to generate wealth with a belt asphyxiating? Uh, the potential of corporations working within our borders, it would be asinine to think or suggest that there's enough breathing room for the company to operate in the Pearl Rubber Delta. I want it wealth to flourish. Sim action must simply be taken now. Uh, Chief Executive Kamai will see to it that the restrictions and regulations that corporations must abide by are loosened significantly. Uh, to throw statutes into the paper incinerator. Our prosperous future will glimmer before us, products will be manufactured, and profits will be generated. Why stand in the way while the corporation toils to realize Guangdong's potential? The hidden traitor's speech. Kamai, quite an audience being addressed like help. The space was packed so tight, staff had to open up the doors to exterior corridors to make space. The more people heard the speech, the better. 
He waited until the last possible moment to take out the folded pages on which he'd written his speech and place them on the podium. He spoke for nearly an hour, on the need to extend Guangdong's state of emergency, regardless of how much overtime needed to be paid out to police, military, and intelligence organizations that wound up to an explosive conclusion. And you may ask me, Komai said, his voice reaching every ear, how much longer the state is to be extended? You may as well ask how many dissenters, how many terrorists, how many traitors am I prepared to live with? My answer is none, none, and none. The audience broke into applause, some clapped out of admiration and respect, some out of fear what would happen if they did it, but most clapped simply because they didn't know what else to do. The speech had its intended effect, cowering the let go and falling anywhere, Komai led. What else are speeches for? They get more followers, right? The Chinese movement. <clears throat> whispers hot in the streets of Guangdong, whispers are shared. Suffering, mistreatment, discrimination, sentiment towards change, towards the way society works, and towards China have begun a seismic shift. Where's this coming from? The Committee of Chinese Labor, it is. Chinese laborers, facing constant mistreatment and systematic discrimination, have been running organization among themselves as a means of defense against these twin threats. Already, sporadic actions have already begun to take place, demanding change in both the working conditions and the treatment of the brethren in society. Such actions, peaceful for now, will not be the future. The economic order that Kamai envisions will place Chinese as cheap and replaceable, for there will always be Chinese. Such draconian measures put down, or put in place. It's no wonder that the Chinese laborers have radicalized much more readily. The status quo put in place and is inherently incompatible with their goals, and it seems as though a significant portion of them have recognized this. If one is able to find one of their cells, revolution is a word of the hour. These cells, scattered and ever-shifting throughout the cities, are the true heart of the movement. Common intellectual is doing such to evade capture and intermittent. intermittent. Through uh, their thoughts and writings, combined with the forces of hundreds of thousands flocking to the cause, are a potential or potent threat to order in Guangdong. So long as this alliance stands untouched, it shall only grow larger and more powerful, and becomes more emboldened to clash with authorities. Begin surveillance of this movement immediately. Not bad. Not bad at all. Beg us for death, though. Well, the delights as the rules, it's not a good idea to be uh, a late to a shift at Hitachi a factory. There was more poor dudes pouring out of the countryside than would be willing to take your place. This being the case, the line outside the punch guard stations in the morning air was usually very long. Now that Hitachi forced everyone on, half, on to half pay, however, nobody could afford to be late. Every minute that took by was another minute of lost wages, another meal that would go uneaten by the workers and their desperate families. As Chen stood in line, unable to keep his eyes off his watch, the factory overseer uh, pulled up right outside the factory gates in his gleaming Hondo. Ignoring the glares from the assembled workers, most of whom had cycled here hours ago to wait in line, he went straight through the stations and into the factory itself. A kiss from a steel roller would do that prick well, the man standing behind Chun observed, and some of the others in line and left. Only until the next one came along, Chun replied, still I'd like to throw his car in there too. The man struggled and leaned into close to Chun's ear, lowering his voice to the faintest whispers. I had to work, I'm going to get some drinks with some guys who think like us. You might like it there, we've got some big plans to see. Chun's curiosity was piqued. Their corporate overlords had always seemed invincible, but now, now there's change in the air. Potent and immense as an oncoming storm front. See you there. I want to reduce corruption, but we can't through the cracks. Their destination was a dimly lit bar in a district of Koshu that Chun had never seen before, nor cared to enter, threatening their way. Through the old alleyways packed with seedy street hawkers and comatose opioid addicts, Chen made sure to never let his contact slip uh, out of sight. He hadn't found the man's name out either. It was better that way, he had been assured, so if he was caught, he couldn't identify his co-conspirators. The bartender let him in through the back room as soon as he caught sight of the woman. Got sight of them. The room stink of stale cigarettes and booze. A small wooden table was lit by a light bulb dangling from the ceiling. The men around the table rose to greet him, shaking his hand and clapping him on the shoulder. We won't tell you our names. One said, once they had all sat down, your friend will issue your assignments when you arrive at work in the morning. This won't be hard stuff. We're not going to force you to do anything you're uncomfortable with. It'll be simple. Running errands, taking care of widows and orphans, shoring up a worker morale, of course. I do have a family, you know, Chen replied, a hint of trepidation creeping into his voice. What happens if they catch me? We'll protect your family, another one of the men said. We always protect our own, but you need to show your loyalty to us. We don't, still don't know if we can trust you yet. Chen realized he didn't have much of a choice. Still, he'd definitely like to stand up to Hitachi monsters. Where do you need me? Gutting social spending. Our already low social spending will be limited to 75% to save money. Oh. Well, I've already maxed it out, but okay. Decrease social costs by a quarter of a... Is that a quarter of a trillion? Ooh. Let the roof collapse, but more growth. But more growth. Let the roof collapse. As long been a concern of our administration to tackle the restrictions of labor regulations. They have been a drain on private spending within the operation of businesses, as heaps of wealth are thrown into the fire to guarantee loosely defined codes alluding to worker protections. To sever any every impediment. <clears throat> Clinging to our ankles as we strive for greatness, we must tear up these darned regulations to save corporations the money. We'll have to spend in better places than suicide nets or air ventilation. We can trust our corporate partners to make sure the decision is best for the country in this regard. After all, we have more than enough in our citizenry to place those caught up in accidental deaths. Don't worry, be happy. If you want to do this one again, please go ahead. Breach. 
Jew stared lately at the low ceiling of this meager apartment, noticing the flakes of white powdery plaster chipping off from the wall due to wear around him. The room was inhabited by a flurry of paragraphs, ink and lead. Loose papers were scattered across the wooden floor, some which protruded from the cracks between the derelict floorboards. The mildew-covered walls of crumbling white plaster were obfuscated by a deluge of posters and flyers stuck haphazardly with strips of tape and colorful pens, depicting rough illustrations of workers and laborers, accompanied by a line upon line of assuring chance and rallies for action. With all he had left, he had de dedicated his livelihood, his effort, his sweat, which had dripped down on the page from his rugged hands, tightly clenching the pen, through the promised liberation of Guangdong's people, a dream just out of reach. His eyes felt heavy, his sense subsided, a so the soft mattress below him, transporting him to a realm of calm and peace, slumber. As tranquility descended onto him, a lack of coughing shots and bangs brought him back to his senses. Adrenaline surged through his blood vessels, his eyes darted around the room as figures busted through the doors, the men began to tug at his feet and unfurling his blankets. Q found himself sitting upon his wooden floor, surrounded by men clad in uniforms and brandishing truncheons, screaming at him with the intensity of a thousand suns. He was too dazed to react. The suddenness of it all brought his con consciousness to its knees. His eyes felt as if they were popping out of their sockets. Uh, his manacles were placed firmly upon his hands, and the officers pushed him out of the room. All Chiu could hear were the ruffling of his papers and the shattering of glass. It was inevitable. Question is not welcome. He, he sat in the front of the apartment, unable to take his eyes off his watch. He'd have been out of two hours after a curfew, four hours after the end of a shift. It wasn't, this wasn't like him. Usually he was home straight after the shift, or sometimes after a couple drinks with uh, workmates. Finally, after an eternity passed, the door finally opened and Chun finally stepped in. He saw Hei and froze. Where were you, Hei asked quietly, trying to wake everyone up in the other room. You know what happens to other people who stay out after curfew. Natasha says would come and break down a door. What the heck were you thinking? You're running errands, Chun replied, tossing a large paper bag. That's dinner for you all. An extra reward I was given for these errands. Errands, White said, emerging from the bedrooms. What errands, Chun? And what happens if you get caught? Who will look after everyone? You'll be looked after, Chun replied firmly. My employers will make it sure that you're protected. And besides, it's nothing dangerous. As deliveries and things like that, I won't get into trouble, I promise. And with that, Chun disappeared into the bathroom. Hei turned to Wai, uh, concern etched on his face. He's not tired, he said. He's always tired when he comes back from work. Now he's been out for hours afterwards. He's, but he's not tired. Outside, wind whistled through the empty streets. Nice. Look at that. A little more money. Man Wolf, Officer Hayashi, said the officer in his familiar hated green shirt, locked down your perimeter. In the other words, stand in front of these crates we were hauling out and look scary. The this difference was only the kind of cooperation that Camp Hotai could stand with the police. Officer Hayashi nodded, saluted, and turned to scan the hallway. They brought up the apartment steel crates, tagged with evidence stickers, at the the door of the far end of the hallway opened, a tiny head stuck out, and both were suddenly pulled back into the apartments. Out of the rain raided apartment and emerged two Camp Hotai agents, hauling out two other men. Hoods fastened around their necks like like they were off to the gallows. Lam had not been given the full story on this raid, only that it was to provide support and look behind him to see the crates they were pulling out. On the side was censored info, and Lam wondered how they got their hands on something like this. They're not talking, said one of the agents behind Lam to his partner. He stood back to attention, but kept an ear up. We'll sweat them, sure, but look at this crap. And here Lam heard the shuffling of papers. They're small fry. Probably got this from a dead drop. I doubt they know half the people who gave it to them. And this was a few less vermin skulking around. After the partner's comments, Lam heard a ladder of a faint puff of smoke. This was concerning, despite Hitachi's increase in security. Radicals and criminals still found shadows in which they could operate. The ranks seemed to be only increasing. He could feel it when he was on patrol, and even here he could feel it. Another door opened, hateful, bean eyes staring back at him. Officer Ayashi narrowed his eyes, bared his teeth, and the intruder retreated into their apartment. But, Lam could not shake the feeling that had been recorded. Catalog is a traitor, and his face is one of the many traitors now known among the unrestful masses. He may try to look like a man, but they're all waiting for the full moon at midnight. Look at all that. 100%. We're doing great. If you want to read about this one, please go to Dangerous Topics. Yoshiko and her editor to use these weekly lunches on the rooftops of their buildings for more casual catch-ups. It was a way to feel out the visibility of, uh, or viability of certain proposals before she made them official or raised concerns she did not want to bring up in a more formal meeting. You know that I've been investigating the recent changes in policing here, Yoshiko had waited, until Takasaki had a mouthful of on onigiri, onigiri to drop that on him. His eyes flashed with fear and anger, but Yoshiko pressed on. It's challenging. The tactics redirecting resources away from the public safety. They're barely capable of directing traffic, let alone investigate crime. Some of the cops here say they've never had so many close calls or dead ends before. On the other side, I swear, when people, some people talk about the police, they get gi gi giddy, giddy. She shoves her chopsticks into the cold udon, they, they, like they're thinking about Joe joke we wouldn't get. Do you think they're getting stronger? I think so. Some of the housewives in my block refuse to go out to certain neighborhoods day or night. They keep talking about shady men they've never seen before, leering at them, smoking in corners where they used to be cops. She said, people are getting scared. Shouldn't we do something to highlight this? Takasaki opened a box up his half eaten lunch. We can't do anything with this. Let's look at we print anything that seems critical of the government. Hitachi places all of the rejects from the PR department, and then we get a knock on our doors. A shadow of the camp by tie hung over the air. A pair. Uh, Yoshiko nodded. She shoved what she learned in the back of her mental uh, filing cabinet, and when she returned to her desk, she ran through the roll Rolodex, looking for something easy to pad out the pages of next week's edition. Something in Yoshiko died when she pulled out the card of someone prominent and safe. 
But look at that growth, it's not bad. Like, one more days left. Regulatory codes we shall annul. And let the roof collapse, because why not? Even more corruption, god dang it. Applause all my own. Walking out of the hotel reception, Kamai is greeted by rancorous applause, and he breaks out into a wide grin in return. He knows it is all rehearsed. A lie born from fear of him, but it matters not. What matters is that through this applause, they are yet submitting themselves before him. Taking the stand, he bows with practice sort of humility before the assembled executives and begins to speak. Gentlemen, a new age of industry is dawning upon all of us, and profit is available to those only willing to reach out and seize it. So I won't tell you the need for regulations to protect us or that. Komai made a contemptuous note, or noise, a sure sign of his displeasure with such statements before continuing. They are wrong at best fools and worst competent traitors who seek to bring your business down with theirs when it falls. Uh, with theirs as it fails. We are the greatest most profitable when we work with the least oversight possible, for the market will regulate itself as necessary, and we only need to allow it. Moreover, labor remains cheap, and this will make it still cheaper still. Acceptable cost of doing business. The loose bolt seemed to glow with a malice in Chun's eyes. For a week, it rattled the machine, threatening. It pointed out to his foreman once, but the line manager three times, and to the man he worked next to every day since he discovered it. All three ignored him. As colleague asked him to be quiet, the line manager ordered him back to work. The foreman was the worst. I understand your concern, lie, but we can't stop production because of a minor technical fault. While working as hard as we can to earn a wage, and to keep up with Hitachi's absurd standards, Chun thought, they kept their heads down, but Chun couldn't help but keep, look, keep looking up. A day passed, another day, another week. A bolt that still did nothing more than rattle. Chun breathed easier. The foreman even let him know that the maintenance would look at this at the end of the day. At lunch, Chun stretched his shoulders, felt fatigue weighed down upon his body. He grabbed his tools and a little box his mother had prepared that night before. It took a few steps away when he heard clattering and panic cries on the floor. He turned as he did it half the factory to its source. The loose bolt shot out of the machine. The machine started to rattle. The conveyor belts that fed out of the machine sped up even beyond Hitachi's safety standards. The half assembled material on the line fired out of the machine like grape shot. Flung at high speeds along the conveyor belt, the workers downrange were struck by dense steel, fortunately leaving only welts and bruises. The workers on the line tried in vain to grab the projectiles, and those that held on for too long were pulled along the conveyor belt, crashing into their neighbors. Many who were injured that day were not seen again, and there was gross ignorance on their part, said the foreman, and he could no longer trust them on the factory line. John said nothing and returned to his post, and a new bolt in the machine shook a little. Cutting social spending. Allocating the entire portion of the budget to the development of lazy intelligences is not a way is only not only a waste of resources, but a waste of our potential. We have no need to invest small fortunes into the development of green spaces, nor pour millions into the funding of mental health care schemes like our predecessors. There's no alternative to solving these issues that punch holes in our pockets other than serving funding altogether. That's a measure Kamai determines to be of the utmost importance after all. Not only will we be saving money now and in the future, but both workers and government can shift their attention to economic matters exclusively. If you're about the economic review, please go right ahead, but yeah, I think we're doing pretty well. Get back to work. 5% more support, huh? Well, so now, how many seats do we have? We have 58 seats, god dang. Hunt down surviving regulators? Why now? An industry should be allowed to develop and prosper. As a responsibility of the administration to fully guarantee and oversee that society functions according to the safety and satisfactory of the industry of the nation. However, throughout the years of Guangdong's existence, she has been constantly and consistently burdened by the practical and counterproductive regulations and arbitrary rules set in place by corrupt bureaucrats and over lenient bleeding hearts that were the staples of, its, of our predecessors. As such, we have begun efforts and motions to eradicate these forces of inefficiency, plaguing our economy, and preventing it from truly operating at an optimal status. The worker does not require excessive amenities and protections, for they are compensated by their wage. Regulations are benchmarked of a decadent past that will be exterminated article by article. The members and presence will be relegated to historical footnotes. The remaining protect, uh, practitioners and men who still abide by these outdated guidelines will be taught the errors of their ways, willing or unwilling. Productivity cannot be hindered by the human condition. Um, even about superior approval, please go ahead. Uh, and the balance of trade, too. Sounds agreeable, huh? Oh, we should have known earlier. We can loosen up some restrictions real quick. Why not? Only 36% growth, huh? Or 36%. 36 billion in GDP. The debt is pretty good, though. That is very good. Hey, better advancements in power te uh, efficiency technology? Very nice. A moment's peace. If you excuse me, Chief Executive, I'll bring you some tea before we discuss the next point of business. Please. Uh, a song stepped out without another word, leaving Kamai Kinichiro. Oh, oh, actually, I've read this one before. If you're into this one again, please go ahead. Oh, maybe we'll learn about Zhongzi Guang, the Mitsui. There you go. Nice. Saul's a faceless dead. 
The light shines brightly for once, its bright rise up, up, unobscured. It's no longer illuminates, incinerate. After all, there is a reason it can be seen. The extensive network of suicide nets set up in the many cities of Guangdong have been removed, and now the sunlight is let through. The ray falls gently onto the so many corpses, the sort of men and women who once caught by the nets hanging in these places. Some of these bodies are recent, still even warm, others are not, have begun to rot, not claimed by anyone. Their families are busy with work in all likelihood, getting time off is an alien concept. Perhaps the dead on the ground will be joined by those families in due time as they too surrender to the sadness. Guangdong is not a forgiving place for the broken. Those countless strangers who pass by the corpses usually let do do their best to ignore the presence and move on with their day. They have no more tears to shed for the dead they do not know. Sometimes, when an especially cruel group of Kenpai Tai men pass, they'll stop to the point and laugh at the foolishness of these dead workers. Perhaps the corpses even prefer that reaction in some small way. At least the soldiers will remember they existed, however briefly. But you know what? We have to end the episode there. If you enjoyed the video, please consider leaving a like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow. See what else we can do with Komaki Nichiro and making Guangdong as best as it can be. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.